Welcome, bienvenidos, chao mong. This is the River Church Community Voter Forum and Ballot Party. I wanted to give a few introductions for us today, uh, particularly if you are part of the Justice League, which is our justice and compassion team. And this is our team that will be putting on the voter forum today. Um, feel free to give them a quick shout out, amen. And at the very end of our time, we'll have a Q&R. So the scope and limitation of today's forum, we only have an hour and a half and we're not planning to talk for that whole entire time. So it means that we'll be limited in all that we can accomplish and do. So we're only able to do for the California propositions, propositions 15 to 18, propositions 20 to 22, 25, and measure G, which is only on the San Jose ballot. So that is our limitation. Um, you will be able to ask other questions and we'll do our best to answer them, particularly those who have questions on measure 23. Um, we have a special guest who will be able to answer a few of those. Finally, um, if you are feeling like me that this is too limited, there's some other resources that you can continue to engage. The River is hosting a question box Facebook group, as well as small group ballot parties where you can learn how to lead something like this in a community of your friends and family. And all of that information can be found at the-river.org slash vote. So you can find a link to all of those things. Additionally, if you need help um, dropping off your ballot, you can request help there. Or if you want to join the river in taking the pledge, the pledge is to be a 100% voting congregation, but 100% of members at the river are informed and actually vote, um, as well as that we're trying to mobilize a thousand people to vote. So that includes our family and friends. So you can take the pledge there. I will now invite our pastor on to offer a prayer. Pastor Brad, I think you can, you can speak. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, let's pray. Spirit of God, rest upon us this Sunday afternoon. For those of us who are a little bit sleepy, Give us energy and strength and imagination to consider the world that you want to bring into being, that you are bringing into being. And even though the work is hard and the measures and propositions are confusing, sharpen our minds and give us joy in your presence and in the company of friends who have wisdom and intelligence to offer. Give us joy in exercising uh, the privilege and the right of voting in this space and connect us deeply with your passion for making justice in the world. So we offer you our time and strength and pray that you would give us great joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we are a, a faith-based congregation. And just to start us, I thought we would go through a few fun um, voting stances that you can find in scripture, but particularly if you are a fan of the musical Hamilton. And I, um, just a hat tip to Brandy Miller, who sort of gave the inspiration for this and some of these stances, but I thought through my multiple watchings and sing-alongs of Hamilton and tried to map a few stances onto some characters. So I'm curious if you agree. And this might be familiar to you if you have looked at the ballot guide for um, small groups and friends and family. So there's one stance, a voter maybe comes with a stance of just trust God. And this is often civil disengagement because God is sovereign and you believe it'll work out in the end. Or perhaps there's a view that everyone is put in power for a reason. Um, the Hamilton character that I thought this most fit was George Washington. And there's a really noble and good thing about this, but it has some flaws. It often implies that God is okay with injustice or doesn't use people to enact God's will, or it's, um, it disregards scripture, which models a partnership with humans, humanity, and God. There's also the conscientious voter who votes according to what you believe is right or feel is right. And I think Alexander Hamilton most um, emblemize, emblemizes that, but it also has flaws because it can lean quite a bit towards individualism. Maybe your own sense of conscience can be selfish and Hamilton certainly experienced some of that and not necessarily holistic or valuing the role of community or the polis um, 
our, our community structure of governance. There is the single issue voter, which is really wonderful, very highly principled voter. Maybe there's one thing or issue that is most important. And I think of John Lawrence in the Hamilton um, musical, but it also has some flaws. It could be a lazy approach. God is often reduced to a single issue and not really the whole world, whole caring um, God. Often it's not very local or community involved. There's the politically active but spiritually complacent voter who might be politically engaged, but their values and morals are shaped by the political world rather than the kingdom. And I think Thomas Jefferson might be an emblem of that. So some of the flaws of it, it can be inauthentic. Jesus isn't a virtue stamp. Um, for Jesus, the means matter as much as the ends. Um, um, morals and values and methods are formed by our faith. It's not just the political moment. I think what maybe most of us might resonate with is the overwhelmed and apathetic voter. Maybe you don't feel like you know enough or you don't want to take a stand. Um, sometimes this is said convictionless because maybe you're in a position of power and you don't wanna tell people what you think because you're worried it will influence them unduly or you strive to be dispassionate or um, objective at all costs. And I think Aaron Burr uh, really represents this not wanting to take a stand, looking to see which way the wind will blow. Um, one flaw of this is that it can be that Christ calls us to conviction, not necessarily um, perfection. The default of standing still is making a choice. It's a choice for the status quo. Um, mm -hmm. I find it's important for us to just start this as a basis because we're striving to give you information that we have researched but we're not trying to model particularly the Aaron Burr style of convictionless discipleship. So throughout this time, you might hear some people sharing their opinions. They're gonna to try to be clear when it is that such, but we are um, trying with the best of conviction from our faith, um, trying to do the best that we can. And we're seeking the Lord in those things as well. It's time for me to stop talking. And I want to invite up the lovely Anne um, to share for the very next portion. Well, I'm Anne. I'm not sure I'm lovely, but I am here. <clears throat> and I have uh, definitely been in contact with uh, the Aaron Burr and myself, and also the Aaron Burr and many of my neighbors and friends. So what I perhaps have to offer is a few tips on how to evaluate the measures cut through just a few tips that might help you to uh, narrow down um, all the barrage of info that's coming in. And I hope this is a value to you. I know it's been a value to me. Number one, do I, do you agree with these goals? What are the goals and where do they sit with me? Not as an individual, although we can't say it's not individual being an individual but where do i stand as a contributor in my community how does this affect my community do i agree that these goals will support people in my community that i can stand up proudly and say yes i i contributed to that i voted for that at one time i used to think when i didn't vote um, my vote isn't going to make a difference. It's not going to change anything. And I realized that that's true, but our votes matter because if we, if we vote collectively with community in mind and with our best intentions in mind and seeing and taking a conviction of where do we stand on each of these propositions and measures, they will count. So the first thing I offer is to ask yourself to cut through a lot of this stuff. Do I agree with the goals? The second one, how does this create its own revenue source? How does this proposition or measure create its own revenue source? What's the bottom line? Who is it going to affect the most? Um, I have been particularly researching Proposition 23, because as a nurse and also having um, a brother on, on dialysis, I had a lot of experience with that. And I realized that the revenue source 
which has helped me make some decisions about this. It hurts the bottom line of the two companies that profit from dialysis. So find out who, how does, what's the revenue source? Does it create its own revenue source? How are you going to be affected? As a senior, and we do have seniors in our church, one of the things that come for people is um, ballot measures that affect our uh, tax base. And people will say, well, I don't have kids in school, um, but we live in a community and we live with kids. And what's gonna happen if we don't agree to that $6 parcel post? So I think that, again, what's the revenue source and can we be a revenue source? There's some things I wanna be a revenue source in, but I ask you, to look at that, what, what is the revenue source on whatever this ballot is? Thirdly, who are the real sponsors of these propositions? That I learned so much from because reading the guide, the California Voters Information Guide, this is the one that has not the measures that has the propositions, one to each family. I hope you didn't throw it away because there's so much to read in here but you don't really find out who, who are the real sponsors. You know what I did? I went on Google and I asked the silly question, who is the real sponsor of Proposition 23? And do you know what came back? Answers that I never would have found anywhere else. So I'm not gonna tell you what they are. I'm gonna hold that tidbit out in case you wanna know who are the real sponsors of 23. But I ask you to look at these three ways. Does it help you? cut back on the confusion that's going on with all the barrage of mail we're getting, uh, fighting and against each other. And where do you stand? What are you willing to commit to? Ask these questions and you'll know. Thank you. That's all I have to offer you, but my love and go vote, go vote. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Anne. <laughs> Um, throughout our presentation, we will show just a cut version of this chart. This is a chart that sort of helps you follow who has funded it, whether the yes um, supporters, which are in green, or the no supporters, which are in red. Um, next, mm -hmm. we will have Chester, who will be sharing about Proposition 15. Great. So Proposition 15 is a business property tax. So this increases funding for public schools, community colleges, and local government services by changing tax assessments on commercial and industrial property. Taxes such properties based on current market value instead of the purchase price, which in often cases was decades ago. So the fiscal impact is that it increases property taxes on commercial properties worth more than $3 million, providing between $6.5 billion to $11.5 billion in new funding to local governments and school. So a yes vote is I want commercial pr properties taxed based on today's market prices. And a no vote is saying I don't want commercial properties taxed based on today's market prices. So uh, with this 6.5 to 11.5 billion, 60% is distributed to local governments and the rest will go to schools and community colleges. And there's a breakdown later in, in the slides that show exactly how much money is estimated to each uh, local government and school. Uh, it ensures that corporate properties, so the example of Disneyland comes to mind that are worth more than $3 million pay their fair share of property taxes. And this is very important because it protects many groups of people. So homeowners, renters, uh, small big business and agriculture, your taxes would not be increased at all. So this exempts those groups of people. So a yes vote means that property taxes on, mo on most commercial properties worth more than $3 million goes up to, goes up to provide new funding to governments and schools. And a no vote means that property taxes on commercial properties will remain the same, no funding for local governments and schools. So some of the uh, arguments for uh, passes of Prop 15 is that this closes the property tax loopholes that have benefited wealthy corporations for decades. Uh, it cuts taxes for small businesses and it protects homeowners and rentals. So they are exempt from this tax increase. 
and it also supports schools, governments, and other vital services. Now, those that are opposing a Prop 15 are saying that the cost of living will increase and everyday items will become more expensive. And also, many new appraisers and support personnel will have to be added, and they are saying that this is hard to regulate and that this will be very uh, difficult to manage. And so there are many supporters for and against. So many Democratic politicians, such as Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, US House representatives and mayors of cities such as San Francisco, Los Angeles, Oakland, Sacramento. And then uh, pretty much all school districts are in favor. Uh, unions like the California Teacher Association, the California Nurses Association, and organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union of North and Southern California, and Pico, California. Um, those that are against include the Republican Party, uh, former LA Mayor Antonio Villa Garosa, uh, several corporations, and many organizations such as uh, the California NAACP, the Small Business Association, the Taxpayers Association, and the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association. And on the bottom, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but there are millions of dollars that have been for and against. Uh, the California Teachers Association has been one of the biggest uh, supporters of the bill. Uh, the Small Business Association and the Taxpayer Association are some of the biggest groups in opposing of the bill. So what does this mean for you and your children? So Santa Clara County, where most of us live, uh, we will receive almost $270 million estimated from the Schools and Communities First Initiative. So this goes from fighting epidemics like the coronavirus to community clinics to mental health services. Uh, firefighters will receive the equipment they need to effectively protect, protect human life and limit damage from wildfires and other natural disasters. Uh, and below is the amount per city, um, how much each city is receiving in terms of providing housing and homelessness protection services, uh, job training, youth programs, and domestic violence shelters and improving quality of life services. So most of the cities that we live will receive uh, several millions of dollars. And special districts uh, such as the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, um, these services have fire safety, keep water safe and drinkable, and also transportation, including roads, infrastructure, and mass transit. And these numbers are below how much each, uh, each of these groups would get. So there are over, so many schools in this area. So I provide a website uh, from, Prop, from CAN Proposition 15, Untangle California's Funding Problems. So all K to 12 schools will receive funding relative to the size of the district and school. So for example, San Jose Unified will receive over 20 million. Allen Rock uh, receives almost 7 million. Cupertino receives almost 10 million. And for charter schools, uh, the relative amounts are to the school. So that's why KIPP and Navigate, uh, KIPP and Downtown College Prep have a specific dollar amount because that is how much will be allocated to those schools in particular. Uh, overall, you know, this will provide more support for teachers, classroom aids, uh, additional books, computers, supplies for in-person and distance learning, breakfast and lunch services for millions of students who would otherwise go hungry, uh, extra nurses and healthcare services, and performing programs such as special education, art, music, and sports. California is one of the worst case states in spending per pupil uh, and is really putting a significant impact of our students and really putting them at a disadvantage. And so this is a great first step to provide a more equitable future for all students. And I proudly and strongly support Prop 15 because it will create better educational outcomes for our students. Thank you. I'll be um, presenting on Proposition 16, which is restoring affirmative action. The text of the proposition is there, but the fundamental question is a vote yes, I want California to allow affirmative action again, or a vote no, I don't want California to allow again affirmative action. Um, so unfortunately my, my diagram didn't show these are some of the essential questions. Do equal rights mean that no group can have an advantage over another? 
or do equal rights mean that forces informed by centuries of oppression make a colorblind legal framework impossible? Some of you may be um, familiar with this diagram. Usually it's just shown with the equality or equity picture um, there. And equality, everyone has a bench the same size, but it still results in not everyone being able to see the game or participate. Equity is different sized um, benches uh, so that everyone can participate. Um, this is, I like this additive to it that reality is sort of addressing this question about the centuries of oppression. That um, reality is that for centuries, there's been some consistent efforts to dig ditches. So some people are even lower down and other people are raised even um, higher than what we see in all of the other images. And this proposition touches on this idea because it sort of challenges how we as a state address this question. So Proposition 209 made affirmative action illegal in the state of California. So that was in many decades ago, but, pro but affirmative action is still legal in 42 other states. Proposition 16 would allow public agencies like local governments and state universities to consider race, sex, color, national origin in order to address diversity factors in hiring, contracting, and admissions. Often when we think of affirmative action, we have a firm university um, picture in mind. And so I'm gonna discuss that. Supporters of Prop 16 say that it will increase racial diversity at top universities, while critics say that it will hurt particular racial groups. And affirmative action triggers a gut reaction in people around fairness. Some people think that it is approaching fairness, others feel that it is unfair. But what is generally used to evaluate merit in our society or who is deserving is often problematic. Usually what we um, evaluate merit or deserving maps to race, social economic status, and immigration status. For instance, grades often map to those themes, SAT scores map to those, as well as extracurriculars map to those. If you um, have been following the recent college admission scandals in our nation, they highlight a separate preferential admission or affirmative action system for the wealthy. Affirmative action would not be the only federal law in place if Prop 16 is passed. There are various state and federal laws already in place to ensure against discrimination. So this is addressing the concern that affirmative action will lead to discrimination. Opponents say that our universities are already diverse and affirm Prop 16 will lead to race to only race as the consideration in emissions or quotas or having quotas. And I just wanna point out that quotas are and will still be e illegal <laughs> against the law, even if Prop um, 16 passes. And um, this proposition is saying that there are ad additional factors that can be considered including race, but it does not mean that race will be the only um, factor considered. Arguments um, for and against Prop 16. The four arguments says that it expands equal opportunity to all Californians, increasing access to fair wages, good jobs, and quality school for everyone. The against argument um, says that it will strip the state constitution of its prohibition on discrimination and preferential treatment based on race, sex, color, ethnicity, and national origin. Um, further four arguments is that it fights wage discrimination and systemic racism, and it opens up opportunities for women and people of color. The against argument is saying that um, we should think about equality, that the state should just treat all Californians equal. All right. And our next presenter is Kat. Hi everyone, I'm gonna be chatting a little bit about Proposition 17. So to make it really simple, a yes vote for Prop 17 will allow those on state parole to vote and a no vote will not allow those on state parole to vote and will continue things the way that they've been going. Uh, so basically in, in more complicated language, uh, Prop 17 would restore the right of those with state parole to vote after they have been released from prison. Uh, it would amend the California Constitution and the cost, um, if you can flip si slides, um, would uh, be a one-time impact in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Uh, and then depending on how many people who are on state parole vote, uh, there could be impact in the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in order to have supplies, uh, ballots, things of that nature. And so while for me, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars sounds like a lot of money, um, the truth of the matter is it's really less than 1% of the general um, fund budget for the state. Uh, so fiscal impact is relatively low. Uh, as people uh, in California are, who are, registered to vote are eligible to run for elective offices if they're qualified. If passed, uh, Proposition 17 would allow people on parole to run for offices as long as they haven't been convicted of crimes such as bribery or perjury, which would disqualify anyone. Uh, so this is one of the big shifts um, that gives cause for concern for some of the people who are opposed. To give you a sense of how many people this would directly impact, there's roughly 50,000 people currently on state parole. And parole, um, for those who might be confused as to what that even is, is the period of time in which uh, someone is uh, leaving their, their prison sentence and has an ongoing sentence um, to a reentry program within their community. And during this program, they have check-ins, um, sometimes home searches without a warrant, um, sometimes drug testing. Uh, and generally on average in California, people stay on parole for about three years. Uh, but in the case of more serious uh, convictions, some people can stay on parole uh, throughout the rest of their lives. So essentially someone who's on parole for a very, very long time uh, isn't having the ability to vote at this time uh, while, while on parole. So there are currently already 17 states and uh, the District of Columbia, DC, that already allow people who are on parole to vote. Uh, so we wouldn't be one of the first states, um, certainly not one of the, the first progressive states. So. Um, this would be a shift that's already happening in other parts of the country. So what are those in favor saying? They're saying that really the purpose of parole is re-entry and re reintegration into society and that voting is a part of that. It identifies that people who are on parole, they have families, they have jobs, they're required to pay their taxes. And so because of that, they should have the right to, to speak into what's happening in their community. Uh, what we also know from research is our criminal justice system isn't always um, equitable. And so this disproportionately impacts people who are black or Latinx um, in, in kind of rescinding the ability for them to vote for potentially expanded years. Uh, additionally, particularly in Florida, there's uh, been some evidence to show that when voting is included as part of this reentry and reintegration, uh, there can actually be a decrease in recidivism, which can um, essentially mean that people who are able to vote might be less likely to engage in further crime. And those who are opposed uh, say that parole is really still part of the sentence that it isn't fair to those who've been impacted by these crimes, that those on parole would be allowed to vote while they're still in the midst of their sentences. Another argument is that people who are on state parole are really the most violent of criminals because those who uh, have local parole, not state parole, are already allowed to vote as part of that. Um, so they're making the case that really um, this is impacting people who, who have engaged in very dangerous crimes um, and that, that it's not right for the people that they've impacted, that they would have this right before their sentence is done. There are about 54 organizations who've come out in support of this proposition, some of the no, most notable being the ACLU of California and the California Democratic Party. Um, and it seems there are only about three organizations who come out in opposition, um, the most notable being the California Republican Party. When it comes to money, really there hasn't been significant spending 
on support or opposition to this proposition. Uh, only about over a million was raised and there's little to no data on any money um, that was raised in opposition. Okay, uh, the next proposition is Proposition 18, which sets voting age at 17 for some 17 year olds. Um, this would amend the California Constitution to permit 17 year olds to vote in primary and special elections, but that's only if they will turn 18 by the next general election and are otherwise eligible to vote. So a yes vote on Prop 18 would say, I want eligible 17 year olds to get a jump start on the voting process. A no vote would say, I want to keep things as they are, no voting at all until age 18. So arguments for no on 18. Uh, the opponents of Prop 18 argue that there is a good reason that 18 is the age of responsibility in California. And they point out that 17 year olds can't enter a legal contract or even participate in a school field trip without a permission slip. So they shouldn't be voting before they are legally adults. Uh, 17 year olds, they say as well, have virtually no experience with things like paying taxes and earning a living. Real life experience is vital to voting, so opponents argue that minors should not be making decisions that impact adults who pay taxes and earn a living. Um, one of the points that they come to most often is that 17 year olds are a captive audience in their schools where they can be influenced by educators who might have one sided opinions of issues on a ballot. And some opponents argue that uh, proponents only want to increase youth turnout using this proposition because they believe it will help pass tax increases and such and elect progressive candidates. The overwhelming majority of Republican statewide office holders are opposed to Prop 18. Uh, arguments on the yes side. Um, Prop 18 only extends voting rights for primary elections and very rare special elections, which would be recalls or elections to fill a vacant seat. Uh, Prop 18 does not change the legal age for voting in general elections. Therefore, it has no impact on who is eligible to vote on the school bond measures, tax measures, et cetera, that the no on 18 camp claims to be most worried about 17 year olds voting on. Proponents argue that the opposition is actually focused on suppressing the youth vote. Proponents of Prop 18 um, argue that there is very little actual or practical difference between a 17 year old and an 18 year old. And they point out that 17 year olds are already able to work and pay taxes or volunteer for military service, and many do. So they should have a say in which candidates they get to vote for when they turn 18. Because the primary elections obviously is when the selection is made for the general election. Prop 18 gives high schools a chance to teach civics with a practical application, guiding students through the voter registration process well in advance of deadlines for their first general election. So low civic engagement is a crisis countrywide, especially among young adults. In, and in California, under 15% of California 18 to 24 year olds are eligible to vote. And on average, only 6% of them do. Early voter engagement is crucial for building overall civic engagement because studies show that once an individual votes in an election, they're more likely to do so again. Um, the funding chart is down at the bottom there, but there's really no significant spending uh, one way or the other. The one additional note that I'll add is that currently I believe there are 18 states that already have passed this sort of a measure. We will be continuing on um, with our various propositions, starting with um, 20. Hey, hey. Um... This is a bill that's largely, or a proposition that's largely around um, crime and increasing what is considered a felony from a uh, misdemeanor. Uh, this is large, can you go to the next slide? Uh, this is largely in response to Prop 57. Um, so the, lot, the previous slide has like a more in-depth description. I think this is kind of easier to, um, understand the main points of it. Um, Prop 57 was created to um, basically reduce the overcrowded prisons in um, California. Uh, and we couldn't afford to, <laughs> um, to have as many prisoners as we were having. So 
uh, Prop 57 was created and it reduced some of things that might be considered felonies and um, uh, kind of the tough on crime type stuff. So Prop 20 is aiming to repeal some of that and reduce the number of people eligible to go before the parole board. Um, they wanna make it easier to charge people with felony theft by rolling back the minimum thresholds. Um, so an example might be if the minimum threshold is $900 to qualify for felony theft, they might reduce it to something like $450. Um, re it would also require the parole board to look more broadly at criminal history when considering release and um, it would reinstate DNA collection um, for people who've been convicted of misdemeanors. So people who support this um, say that Prop 57 allowed potentially violent offenders to be released from prison on parole e more easily. Um, certain violent crimes uh, such as the rape of an unconscious person uh, are no longer considered violent crimes. Um, there's been an increase in theft since um, passing Prop 57 and that um, by going harder on it, you will decrease it. Um, and then it is, this is largely funded by kind of tough on crime orgs like police organizations. Next slide. Uh, those who are in the no camp tend to be part of or representing communities of color. Um, they, argue that increased funding towards law enforcement takes away funding towards rehabilitation. Um, in response to some of the concerns about theft, they would say that crime as a whole has decreased across the United States and is at an all-time low. Um, and the law needed to change to reduce the amount of people in prison altogether. So um, increasing this would uh, roll back some of the very important changes that have been made by Prop 57. And um, they would also argue that a lot of violent crimes are still included and that the parole board still has a significant amount of discretion and already looks at the criminal history of a person up for parole. Um, and generally those boards are made up of former law enforcement officials or people who tend to have this stance um, to begin with. Hi everyone, I'm Allison and I'm here to talk to you about Proposition 21, which has to do with rent control. So at a high level, Proposition 21 expands the local authority's ability to enforce um, or, or enforce and enact rent control in their cities. Um, but what does that mean? Um, I'm going to walk you through some background and context for what that means today. So overall, a yes on Prop 21, oh, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. Yes on Prop 21 means I want my city or I want my, what uh, local authorities to be able to expand rent control. And a no says, um, I wanna keep things the way they are and um, keep things, um, keep the state limits on rent control and the existing local limits on rent control. So um, Ihoma, if you can go to the next slide. So some background and context, some of the existing problems that Prop 21 is seeking to mitigate are um, as a result of rising rental housing prices and, and just high um, property, property costs in California, a, more, a majority of California renters pay more than 30% of their income in rent. Within that, a third of these rental households will spend more than 50% of their income on rent. And in, while California's population is 12% of the country, um, it is home to 22% of the US's homeless population. So there's also concern that with the pandemic and um, how that is affecting people's um, ability to earn income right now that Californians are at higher risk to become homeless um, during this time. So um, additionally, fam families, when they're faced with this um, insecure uh, housing insecurity, they have to decide between paying for their rent and um, paying for other ba meeting basic needs um, that 
impacts their health ne negatively, physically and mentally. Um, there are existing rent control limitations right now. They are uh, called the Costa-Hawkins Rental Housing Act. And under Costa-Hawkins Rental Housing Act, um, rent control cannot be applied to single family homes. So rent control is applied to apartment buildings, uh, multi-unit housing. Um, and rent control can also is also not applicable to homes that were completed on or after February 1st, 1995. So homes that were built after that um, are, are not subject to uh, rent control. And also um, rent control laws cannot tell landlords what to charge when new tenants come in. This is known as vacancy decontrol. And so that's how you'll end up in situations where, um, you know, when a set of tenants will have paid a certain amount of um, in, in rent and then uh, they either voluntarily leave or they get asked to leave and then the next set of tenants has to pay a, a significantly higher cost in, in rent. Um, can you go to the next slide please, Ihoma? Okay, so a yes on Prop 21 doesn't mean like new sweeping rent control laws are gonna go in place since California already permits local authorities to create their own rental control legislation and that's not going to be changing. Um, and in fact, only about 15 cities in California have some form of rent control in place right now. So um, the Prop 21 is going to amend the Costa-Hawkins uh, housing Act so that rent control can apply to any home that's 15 years or older. So now it's not just apartment buildings or multi-tenant buildings, um, it applies to single family homes as well. And this is a rolling 15 year window. Um, so, and that's kind of been put in place to help builders to be able to stay competitive and rent out, uh, rent out newer properties at market value. So once your home is it's that 15 year mark, then um, it's subject to rent control. Um, now, there are some exceptions to this. Like if you are an individual owner and you own up to two properties, then you, um, you are exempt from these rent control um, limiting, or, or from, from rent control. And the other thing um, that Prop 21 is going to amend is now when a new renter comes in, owners can only increase the rent up to 15% uh, within the first three years. Um, and then after those three years, the usual rent control measures will apply. And now um, some interesting things to note it are in um, 2018, there was a, um, a prop, Proposition 10 was on the ballot and that sought to repeal the Costa Hawkins uh, rental housing act in its entirety, um, kind of removing any rent control limitations and giving local, the local authorities a carte blanche to whatever kind of uh, rent control laws that they wanted to create. And that did not pass, 59% of Californians voted against it. Um, but then in 2019, um, Governor Newsom signed into law uh, Assembly Bill 1482, which then imposed a statewide rental cap of up to 5% um, rental increase per year. Um, and that's on top of inflation as well. Um, and kind of offered protections for tenants from unfair evictions. So that law went into effect in January of 2020. Um, that, uh, AB 1482 that just got passed and is now in effect and Proposition 21 are actually very, very similar to each other. Um, the key difference between what is in effect now statewide and um, Proposition 21 is that with Proposition 21, um, when a renter moves out, there's that limitation of 15% now because under the state law, there is no limitation. Like currently um, under the state law, when tenants move out, you know, uh, landlords are allowed to reset their properties to market value. Um, so that that is one of the key differences between what exists now and Prop 21. But otherwise that kind of like 
um, five percent increase is is and, and the fifteen year um, rolling window of where rent control doesn't apply. Those are all the same. Okay. Um, okay. So next. A um, supporters to Prop 21, uh, the main supporter that, that is kind of funding this is the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, other supporters include uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, um, California Nurses Association, the California Democratic Party. Um, and opponents to this uh, include corporate landlords, real estate and apartment associations, and um, Governor Newsom as well because he says that the statewide law that he passed kind of, um, he believes that addresses a lot of problems that Prop 21 seek to address. Um, supporters, sorry, I'm flopping a little bit, but then um, supporters to Prop 21 will also say that, you know, since California real estate prices are crazy high, um, you know, when a tenant moves out, sometimes landlords will reset rental prices to kind of match market value without updating their properties. And so um, people will be end up being faced with paying an exorbitant amount of money on um, like junky properties. And so Prop 21 will seek to, um, to mitigate that. Um, a, a common opposing view is that there, there's a nonpartisan study through MIT that rent controls like this result in a reduction in home value prices, which results in a reduction of property values. Um, one rebuttal to this is that once a property owner sells their home, the property value resets, right? And the so the property that, that the um, but the market value property tax payments on those sales could be sufficient to offset it. Um, there's also the perspective that if families are paying less in rent, then they'll have more money to spend, which will then increase local and state revenue through sales tax. Um, so in a nutshell, that's Proposition 21. And hopefully this can shed some light into whether or not 21 um, will be able to achieve its intended objective in offering protection to California renters um, from rising rental costs and as well as protecting the elderly and the veterans in California. I've got Prop 22, which uh, it has the uh, dubious distinction of being the most expensive ballot measure ever. Almost definitely have heard of it. So Prop 22 is the gig worker benefits proposition. Um, it exempts app-based ride and delivery companies like Uber, Lyft, Instacart, and DoorDash from providing employee benefits to most of their drivers. It classifies app-based drivers as independent contractors instead of employees and provides most of them with other compensation. And if you were thinking, I thought they already were independent contractors, there was an Assembly Bill 5 that was passed um, that reclassified them as employees and the companies, the companies are fighting that in court and they prepared this ballot initiative to try and nullify it before it can be uh, legally put into effect. So a yes vote on Prop 22 um, says, I want gig companies to provide limited contractor benefits. Um, and a no vote says, I want gig companies to treat and pay drivers like employees. And the essential question, which is what both sides seem to believe they have the answer to, is what's best for the drivers. So there's a breakdown of pay. If Prop 22 fails, then California Assembly Bill 5 that I mentioned will apply. Um, so what drivers will make is base pay, which is minimum wage uh, that ranges from 13 to 16 dollars, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, expenses at 57 cents a mile over time for any hours over 40, 40 hours, um, 150%. And benefits like paid leave, health care, workers' comp, liability insurance, things like that. Um, and if uh, Prop 22 passes, the predictions of what will happen are crazy extreme from one end to the other. Um, they don't match up at all. So uh, the legislative analyst office down here, uh, the gray box in the middle, says that uh, 
th that currently most drivers probably make about 11 to $16 an hour after expenses and wait time. Um, now, uh, if Prop 22 passes, um, that will change to 100% of 120% of minimum wage, as opposed to uh, the the AB5 law. It's not hours that you're actually working; it's the hours that you are engaged. So, if you are waiting, as opposed to transporting passengers actively or transporting groceries or whatever, uh, then you're not getting paid. So, and then there are limited benefits that are given um, that vary with the amount of engaged hours. So uh, the, there's a UC Berkeley labor study that says that after uh, subtracting driver expenses, that uh, drivers will actually uh, have pay that drops well under minimum wage, under $6 an hour on average. And then on the other extreme, um, there's a study that was commissioned by Lyft and DoorDash at UC Riverside and the researchers there factored in lower wait time and expenses. And their estimate was that drivers would make 25 to $27 an hour. So uh, yes on 22 vote would re reinstate app drivers as contractors. Um, so here are some of the arguments on the yes side. Um, despite widely disparate estimates about how much they may earn, some app drivers say that they will vote yes in the hopes of keep keeping similar levels of pay and flexibility while obtaining some of the new benefits that the law provides. Now, some gig companies are saying that the reclassification will cause them to reduce or eliminate service in less profitable areas, to cut hundreds of thousands of jobs, increase wait times, raise prices, or stop operating in California altogether. Um, gig companies say that without Prop 22, they'll have to limit the worker flexibility that most find attractive about this type of work and uh, note that uh, current law does not limit flexibility. The current law that would be in, in effect if 22 was voted down. The other side seems to imply that there, it, flexibility would be illegal. That's not the case. Uh, under Prop 22, drivers with at least 25 hours a week of engaged time, again, transporting passengers or packages or whatever, would earn a healthcare contribution equal to the average employer contribution under the Affordable Care Act those with 15 to 24 hours of engaged time would earn half as much. The yes on Prop 22 side claims that 80% of app drivers work less than 20 hours a week. And that's under the threshold for health benefits under the Affordable Care Act. So they argue that for such drivers, some help toward healthcare is better than none. The no on 22 side disputes that 80% figure as you'll see on the next slide. So the no on 22, uh, uh, no one 22 is that app drivers must be employees per California Assembly Bill 5. Um, this would mean that drivers are guaranteed minimum wage, even during the 30% of time that the average driver spends waiting for work, which some believe will mean, mean a more stable paycheck. Gig companies wrote Prop 22 for themselves, given reporting that they've overworked, underpaid, and failed to protect drivers even before food delivery surged during the pandemic. Opponents doubt that companies would spend $185 million to write and pass Prop 22 if they didn't think it was a great deal for them instead of the workers. Companies would share liability for employee accidents or driver crimes such as sexual assaults. So they'd be motivated to protect the public by hiring more carefully, by training and monitoring driver, drivers more carefully. Um, and uh, Prop 22, on the other hand, would eliminate required sexual harassment training and companies wouldn't need to investigate sexual harassment claims. They might, but they wouldn't be required to. Large companies would have to provide health insurance to full-time drivers. That's on average, those that work on average 30 plus hours per week for 120 or more days a year. The no on Prop 22 camp cites a University of California study finding a majority of drivers qualify as full-time, including about 70% of Uber and Lyft drivers. Uh, the yes side disputes that study, but I was not able to find actually where they're getting their numbers from. Um, they may have a study that does support it, but I didn't find that in the material that I was looking through. Labor advocates fear that other companies will exploit the Prop 22 loophole, shifting more of their workers to gig worker status in order to avoid paying for employee benefits. And if any of Prop 22's effects prove too detrimental, such as pay dropping below minimum wage, 
or sharp rises in the uninsured as other companies transition to gig workers, or if the Affordable Care Act is overturned and a full rework is needed, it would be extremely difficult to amend, much more difficult than is normal. It would require a 7 8 supermajority of the legislature to amend it. And here you can see what the spending is like and why this is the most expensive ballot initiative um, ever. That's uh, who's supporting it is all the gig companies. And then there is a much smaller amount of money from workers and um, organizations in particular. All right, I will breeze through the next two so we can get to our live questions. Proposition 25 is abolishing cash bail. A yes vote says that you want California to switch from cash bail to a risk-based algorithm. A no vote says you want to keep the system as it is, or which is very important, you are waiting for a better solution. Um, I mentioned that because most people agree that the bail process has flaws and is not good. So um, I just want to delineate that the no vote can also mean you're waiting for a better position, a better solution. In the, the bail process, what is bail? So if you are arrested, you're often booked, taken to jail, you can make a phone call. That can be to your family and friends, it can be to your lawyer. And often the court sets some amount of bail, which is some money or property that you have to give up or pay to be released from jail while you are awaiting your actual trial. And that's called your arraignment when the charges are read out. Um, the, the bail, what it can be is you can either put up the money yourself or you can um, go to a bail bondsman who will put up the money for you in the form of a bond. To, um, to put up this money, they charge a premium, which is usually 10% in California, and this is non-refundable. So and a bail schedule is when the amounts per crimes of bail is set. So for instance, if you commit forgery in California, the bail schedule says that bail is set at $20,000. So 10% of that $2,000 would go to the bail's bondsman, regardless of what happens with your trial, if you show up, if you don't show up, you will not get that money back. Okay. In 2018, Senate Bill 10, SB 10, eliminated bail and changed the process for getting released from jail before trial. And this would have gone into effect, but a referendum was called on it. And this proposition, Prop 25, is that referendum. A yes vote means that SB 10 will go into effect. A no means that voters will reject SB 10. Um, and there are three specific themes that it changes. One, this change would be it will eliminate the release on bail. So the money bail process will be over. Two, it would create a new process for getting released before arraignment, before your charges are um, heard. And three, it can change the existing process for release at arraignment. So after your charges are set, it will change what happens after that point. And just for context, currently two thirds of all people in California jails are awaiting trials. So this would in, um, immediately affect a sizable population of people. So the three things. One, el eliminates the release from county jail on bail. So in this current system, often the wealthy, even though they have, um, regardless of innocence or guiltiness, they usually get out because they have the money to set for bail. But people who are poorer or less affluent means they usually have to stay in jail because they cannot come up with the money to post bail. This would eliminate the bail system for all groups. Nobody in California, for any crime will be able to put up money to get out of jail using bail. That will be completely gone. The second thing is that it will create a new process of release before arraignment. So this is the new process. If your crime is a misdemeanor, you must be released from um, jail within 24, within 12 hours of um, being put in jail, of being processed in jail. So this is for all misdemeanors with a few exceptions, which I list there. The second thing about that is that um, there's a sort of a sub process for the few felonies that do not qualify from this 12 hour release. And in that case, you need to be assessed whether you are at risk for committing a new crime in between your, your arraignment and um, when you're released, or if you are at risk for failing to appear. And the, um, the tool that gives this assessment is a computer algorithm. It considers several factors, um, which I think I list somewhere here, but um, it is a, a computer algorithm that creates this assessment. And the judges, they are able to overrule this assessment 
but it will be given to them to consider. Additionally, there would be a separate organization that is created that handles the computer algorithm, but also handles their recommendations to the judges. The recommendations mean what should be the conditions of your release if you are released, what should be, um, are there uh, certain check-in requirements that are needed, whether that's electronic monitoring, monitoring or sort of a probationary check-in. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out here is that if you are at high risk, there's a separate process. Um, and in all cases, regardless if you're low risk, 12 hours, medium risk, which is sort of to be determined high risk, you must have a trial and an assessment within 36 hours of being placed in jail. So in that method, it sort of guarantees a speedy trial, at least within 36 hours. Um, I mentioned the, the separate um, agency that um, determines the assessment. The third thing that it changes is what happens at arraignment. So your charges are heard, and often there is a determination that you can be released on your own recognizance. So this is OR in the literature. And if you are released OR at your arraignment, maybe there's some new evidence and the district attorney can say that you need to have a new hearing, a new assessment, or um, maybe there's some new evidence or you failed to appear or you committed a crime in between. And so they could revise that decision. And if they choose, they can hold you in jail um, indefinitely. There is no process of getting out aside from a trial and the verdict determination. Benefits. This will decrease um, county jail costs and population if it passes. It ends the cash bail system, which is inherently flawed, which allows wealthier people to pay to avoid jail while less affluent people have to stay incarcerated before they've been convicted, um, simply on the basis of not being able to pay. It would put an end to the bail industry, which um, charges that 10% premium of all bail costs. And it um, affirms the right to a speedy trial. So everyone must have their hearing within three days. Um, the concerns, and there are many concerns, There'll be increased state and local pre-trial costs. So in all of this assessment, all of this requires more state and local investment in the pre-trial costs. Um, civil rights advocates say that the computerized risk assessment um, distills a person down to a set of static elements and they have many pitfalls, that these are inherently biased against the young, the poor and people of color. They're also concerned of the amount of judicial discretion that this grants that Judges can override low risk assessments and keep people in jail. And another concern is that this um, separate department that comes up with this pre-trial assessment, it, based on the stipulations for how it can be enforced, it's most likely to fall in the probation departments. And um, there's no amount of money that they say that they will give to this. So they say this is a blank check for probation departments. And finally, it would complicate uh, ongoing uh, California Supreme Court case that could invalidate um, cash bail statewide. This is a case where um, this retired ship worker is accused of um, robbing an elderly neighbor of $7 and their bail was set at $350,000. And this is currently in the California Supreme Court. And it, depending on this ruling, um, well, if Prop 25 passes, it would invalidate any ruling from the court. So that would be done. Um, otherwise, this ruling could could change the law anyway. All right, I'm going to skip our brain break and breeze to the last one. Measure G, which is just on the San Jose um, ballots, it's the exp expansion of San Jose Independent Police Auditor Oversight. So it says that a yes vote is expanding um, the oversight of the San Jose IPA, which stands for Independent Police Auditor. A no is that you want to keep the system as it is. So the independent police auditor is um, sort of the body that's, that's charged to investigate the police. Um, and currently, if you look at the flowchart, the way that cases work is that only internal affairs can actually in investigate police. So the IPA cannot initiate any investigations. They must wait to internal affairs investigate. And they can only analyze the results of an internal affairs investigation. Any evidence that internal affairs does not provide, they cannot look at. They only can see internal affairs investigation that has been already initiated. 
This would change this. It'll expand IPA's oversight. It would add four seats to the Planning Commission and extend the timeline for redistricting of the IPA. And what all of that means, I sort of mentioned it, it would allow the IPA to investigate, to initiate investigations, um, which includes the review of officer-involved shootings, use of force incidents causing death or great bodily injury, review department-initiated investigations against officers, and other technical amendments regarding um, IPA. The Planning Commission is a citizen-led advisory body of the City Council. They can grant permits, such as conditional use permits um, that, and that don't require uh, council approval. And there's a limited number of seats on that, so this would expand it to be representative of each district plus one additional seat. And finally, um, it would allow them to redistrict based on when census data arrives. So that's the summary of it. I, so a lot of people participated, especially if you're a part of the River Church um, in the protests that were happening this May and June. And in the very first day of protests, there are about um, 450 complaints and they're made against one officer in SJPD. Um, and so for instance, for that case, the IPA was not able to initiate any complaints, even though people complained that the officer should be investigated. They were only able to examine any sort of internal affairs investigation that was done. And those actually started way beyond um, the time of the complaints. So this officer was still out on the streets, even though there were all these complaints against them because they were not able to initiate any investigation. Benefits, um, well, these are just organizations that support it. There's no one really opposed to it. Um, it was by unanimous council vote. So um, everyone seems to like it. Let us move into our Q and R time. I will uh, skip this last one. So this is a summary of our, the ones we went over and Anne is available to answer questions about the dialysis clinics. If you are a panelist, can you put, allow your um, video to be shown just so people can see your face. Um, and if you have any questions, remember there's a separate Q and A section that might be the best place for your questions. That way we can all see them together. Um, the first one, Carol asked about diversity studies to be in place about whether discrimination is happening. I assume that's in relation to Prop 16, which is the affirmative action again um, one, but um, I do not know. And there's some, <laughs> there's some answers that will be just that way. We don't quite know. But what I will do is to investigate it and I'll um, get back to you. We'll put it in the River Question Box Facebook group, the answer for that. I do know that federally and statewide, they're sort of regular reviews of discrimination, but I don't know what, they're, what they define as discrimination and their laws that are in place are to prevent discrimination. But we'll investigate what those are and get back to you. Any other questions that people have? Um, Michael's question was answered about quota. Do we want to read out the ones that were answered? There are three of them, um, just so that everyone else hears them or? Sure. Um, Michael asked about uh, what is the definition of meeting quotas, which I answered there. A quota is a number. So for instance, if you say, I have 10 slots, 20% has to be you know, X ethnicity, then you would hire until you get that quota and then you would stop hiring um, of that ethnicity because you've met the quota. So it's just a number that you set that you need to meet. Um, and, there's a question about, yeah, go ahead, Benji. Yeah, the Prop 22 uh, question was whether it allows for middle ground with some employees and some part time contractors. Uh, my answer is that it's basically no, it does not allow app-based gig companies to hire drivers as contractors. It can only hire them as part-time or full-time employees. But there are there's a, a formula to dis determine whether the person is an app-based gig driver. Um, so there are certain types of uh, drivers that they could hire as contractors. And as I understand it, the main deal is that they can't be carrying out the company's primary business. So it could be the guy that drives around uh, supplies for vending machines at headquarters or an employee shuttle driver, that sort of thing. If they were an independent contractor, that would be fine because they are not actually carrying out Instacart's uh, business plan or DoorDash's or whatever, that kind of stuff. Oh, here's another one from Lauren. 
Prop 25, do you know who put it on the ballot and whether the timing relates to the pending Supreme Court? Oh, that's a good question. I forget when exactly Prop um, SB 10 was signed. It was signed in 2018. So uh, the referendum I think was in January and the largest funders of it are the bail industry. So um, let me see if I can, I'm not sure how, well, maybe I'll just go back quickly. So if you see at the very bottom, the no, it's mostly bail bonds industries that are funding it. And generally um, those are the people who put it on the ballot in addition. I don't know so, if it's Stephen <laughs> Belmer. I think that's Steve Ballmer, isn't it? Uh, who is one of the co-founders of Microsoft. Yeah, Ballmer. Steve Ballmer is one of the co-founders of Microsoft. And Connie, I assume, is his wife. Any other questions? Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, it's on Prop 25. A no vote could mean waiting for a better option. I do not know of anything that is on the works. All of the um, reports of the original proposition that uh, started this is that civil rights advocates were advocating lobbying for bail to be overturned. And at the very last minute, there are a lot of changes added into this proposition in the legislature, which is why it ends up with a lot of civil rights groups opposing it, as well as the bail bond industry. So I don't know if there's anything better in the works as of now. Um, and you've been requested to talk about 23, but um, I don't know if there's a specific question about it <laughs> that she could answer. Okay, well, I will put out what I know and um, what I, my experiences, and uh, I know people can take it from there, especially along with the three questions that I, that I put out in the beginning. Well, first of all, 1960 is when dialysis started in this country. Dialysis was initially set up for people who were waiting for a kidney transplant. Those were predominantly young people, people probably up to the age of 45 or 50 were what we were looking at. So keeping in mind, dialysis was set up for people who were waiting for transplants. In 1972, President Nixon um, decided that that would be Medicare would pick it up for all people, that Medicare would no longer, it wasn't for people 65 and over, that for dialysis, anyone that was given a diagnosis and a doctor referral could receive dialysis and could also, it would be paid for through Medicare. So a whole lot of things happened then. Let's fast forward, you have to draw your own conclusions on this. Let's fast forward to today. Dialysis, there's two companies that handle the whole dialysis. It is Davida and Fres Fresenius, only two. The cost of, usually a patient, whether they're young or old, will have dialysis three times a week for four hours, uh, uh, four hours at a time. Each treatment, costs under $300. Medicare will pay $269 per treatment. The rest is absorbed by the, um, by the company. If you have private insurance along with Medicare, it will be, they will charge private insurance $1,169. So the disparity seems to be, and which I experienced with my brother who had amazing insurance, he would be taken before somebody that was poor that was only gonna get their $269. We would show up at the clinic and um, you had an, a time, but if more people needed it done, he would get taken first. So, 
we 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 make our decisions in life, I believe, on our experience. Our experience certainly dictates whether we agree with something or whether we don't. So what I've seen both as a nurse and in my own personal life is that dialysis was not meant to be an extender of life forever. A typical 80, 85 year old person on dialysis three times a week, four hours a day or in home dialysis, which is even more, but that's another whole aspect. will live about two and a half years. That will be what's added to their life as opposed to a much younger person where you probably will go between seven to 11 years. Dialysis was not set up to extend life forevermore. So what Proposition 23 by wanting a doctor on the premises and more oversight is because people, the, the rate of infection in people on dialysis is huge. The clinics, do not have to report those rates of infection because then they'd be looked at and they could be closed down. Or someone would come in and truly say, we need to examine everything that's going on here. People that are for um, are against this will say, well, they, they can't get on dialysis unless they have a, a doctor, a kidney doctor. That's very true. However, once the kidney doctor gives the dial diagnosis, Older people are comorbid. They have all kinds of other problems. Dialysis affects your heart very, very, very greatly. The dialysis kidney doctor doesn't check the records to see that you also are seeing a heart doctor, a lung doctor, a pulmonologist. They don't have to. Greater oversight would require that those doctors have to talk to each other. They have to look at what the patient that's presenting is, not just that they're in end stage of renal failure. So having a doctor on the premise, um, people will say, well, we're short of doctors. We don't have enough doctors. Kidney doctors are not, are not the ones that are working in the dialysis clinic. The dialysis clinic, having a doctor on board would be residents, would be people that haven't even declared their specialty yet. The nurses union is, is against Proposition um, 23. And I was really curious about that. And then I looked a little more into it and realized that people, most of the people that work in dialysis are trained to do dialysis. They're dialysis technicians. People that work in those clinics are also not allowed to be part of a union. And that sets up a whole other thing. The bottom line is, from what I've researched, what I, what I know personally, is that the profits will be limited if this passes. The profits to the companies will be limited. They will have to treat my brother who passed the same as your mother who was on Medi-Cal and has nothing. There's no <clears throat> money involved if this passes for the big companies to continue. Okay, who are the real sponsors? The sponsors that ask for yes are the labor unions and the healthcare workers. These are the people that don't have the big degrees. These are the people that are doing the work. These are the people that see people go into codes, meaning they have a cardiac arrest because they are done. They can't do dialysis anymore, but the family wants them to continue because they're not ready to let go of them. The people that are against it are the Repu there too, the Republican Party and DeVita and Fres Fresenius. I don't have a lot more to tell you other than as I watched my brother here on dialysis, falling down each time he'd come home, but so committed to getting this dialysis because he wasn't ready to die, because he was afraid that he would be alone and would be in pain, because dialysis is for life. If you're on dialysis, you cannot get off dialysis. This is not a one, this is not 
and there's no kidney coming for you at 80 years old. There is no kidney coming for you. Um, he was afraid. And once he could be worked through those fears, and although I have to tell you that uh, his kidney doctor was very unhappy when we took him off a of dialysis. Uh, he couldn't understand it. And my brother died less than two weeks later at home on hospice, uh, not in pain and not alone. So please go back to the first thing I asked you. Do you agree with the goals? Do you agree with the goals? If you're 85 years old and you're scared to death to die, and there's many of us Christians that perhaps are still afraid to let go of that last thread because of the unknown, you may feel differently about it. But what do you agree with? And where? who's making the money? Is it making care better for everybody? No, not at all. And that's all I have to say. And it probably was more than enough. So, and maybe too much. So I apologize if it was too much. These are my thoughts, not the river's thoughts. So don't hold it against them. They're a great group of people. And the Justice League is a great group too. But thank you for asking. Um, well, and don't, don't go off yet because Anne's gonna close us out in prayer. I just wanted to let you know there will be an exit survey. It should appear in your browser um, at, when we end this call. If not, um, I will certainly email it to everyone. Just if you if, let me know if you don't receive it. But um, at the exit survey, you can sort of give us feedback. You can also indicate if you want to receive the slides that you saw today. So that there will be a space for that. Look out for it. And let's close us out. Okay. Let's take a moment first to open ourselves up to what we want to ask of God today, what we ask of him, how we ask him to come to us, to help us with these decisions, perhaps in a posture of open hands to let him know that we're ready to receive it. Father God, look at us here doing our best with all of our intentions to be responsible participants, contributors, not consumers in this beautiful world you've given us. Please open our hearts and our minds to all the opinions that are going on around these issues, to be open to the differing opinions and to hold them and to hold them up to you. We ask you to influence us in the ways that will affect us, our families, our communities, the world, California, and be thoughtful and prayerful, respectful, and well-intentioned. We ask you to bless all of us as we leave this today. Maybe, maybe angry at some of the things we've heard. Maybe happy with some of the things we heard, certainly more informed. Um, and comfort us and hold our hands as we come to make these very important decisions sooner than later. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for another day of life, for another day of love, for another day of companionship, and for all the good things and remind, remembering that you are on your throne. Nothing will happen by accident, but we are participants with you. And it's important that we stand counted and we stand for something. In Jesus' name, we ask all of this, amen. Amen. Um, I dropped the form in the chat in case people wanted to grab it now. Thanks so much for joining us. Go in peace. Remember the other events. 
the-river.org slash vote, where you can find, sign up for the Facebook question group. We'll answer every Monday some more in-depth questions, so you can ask them there. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Thanks for um, participating, all that everyone was able to share. <laughs>